Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of the CSFL Kickoff Show podcast and boy have we got an action packed episode for you guys today. We obviously have the first three rounds of the draft to try and break down. We're going to be getting your views, my views, talking about teams, players, all of that good stuff to come as well as breaking down some trades that have happened and occurred, some that have gone to trade committee, giving views and opinions on that. Before we conclude the show with the usual CSFL GM Bites, it's going to be action packed. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, without further ado, let's go straight in to the news and the key points for this week. So, for those of you obviously following along, will know that in the CSFL, we are in the middle of our draft, we are coming towards the closing end of the third round. And what better time than to take a little look, a stock take, a reflection on how some of the draft has gone so far. And of course, there is nobody better placed to give that view than our GMs themselves. So obviously we put together a, a short poll for you guys to answer. Thank you very much for everyone who has come back and, and given us some really amazing detailed answers uh, it's fantastic and we're going to just try and break down some of those things on the show to begin with today so we asked you essentially four questions um, the first one was who do you think won the first round and why who do you think lost the first round and why which player do you think had the brightest future ahead of them and which drafty dropped too far in your eyes and well, we had some, some fantastic responses for all of it. And you guys did not hold back with your views on some, some other teams. It's fantastic to see. So I'm going to just try and break down some of that and, and throw my own sort of opinion as we go along. So we'll start with sort of the first one, which is, you know, what, what do you, who do you think won the first round and why? And I think what was really interesting in, in looking at this and seeing your, your comments and views was there was a lot of teams that had, um, both answering the first question of you know doing really well in the draft to begin with um, in this first round, and others who have um, also scored fairly um, the same in in terms of who maybe didn't have a good first round of the draft. So it's fantastic to see that there's that conflict in nature, which shows that whilst there is some logic involved in terms of how the drafts work here and how you scout. There is always an element of judgment in, in terms of what GMs actually think of, uh, of the other teams and how they are, they are doing, which comes into probably a little bit of how, how the teams are run, what type of strategy they're running, what they look for in players. And it, it's fantastic to see. I mean, I'll give you a couple of teams that are kind of were in those two camps. Um, the Carolina Panthers, who we know in the second round had a silly amount of picks, and we'll come to that later probably. But they, they obviously... Um, People, um, other GMs suggested that they had a great first round, others saying they didn't. Um, same with the San Francisco 49ers, same with the, the LA Chargers. Some people thinking that the, you know, the Chargers dealing up to take number one. Um, obviously, felt that, that was, some people thought it was too high a value, some people thought it was great value. It was, it, it's, it's fantastic to see. But there was a couple of um, interesting ones in terms of a couple of teams that really... Um, people kind of came to the consensus and agreed that they did have a really, really good first round. And, and the one team that stood out in all of the, uh, the analysis that we, we had and all the answers from, from our GMs was the Cleveland Browns. A lot of people were sort of saying that the dealing down from the first pick to the third pick, picking up um, Jake Jacoby Brissett, um, a player in a position where they, they desperately needed someone, a decent quarterback, as kind of, you know, Run, run home with a lot of our GMs in the league that that was a, a shrewd move by uh, by by yet by Jedi and and the, and the Cleveland Browns. So you know, great to see that that that's working. And, and I'm, in terms of Jacoby Brissett, I mean, I think it's fair to say he is going to be a pretty good starting quarterback to begin with. He's got some great stats off the bat in terms of his intelligence, his arm, his accuracy. Probably a little bit more in terms of if he can continue to develop that along with his position skill then he's, he's probably going to be a very, very good quarterback in this league. And I'm going to be really interested to see how, how he does with the Cleveland Browns. But general consensus was that they did, you know, they did very, very well in the first round, being able to deal down 
acquire some assets and also pick up the quarterback that they probably probably needed. So if we move on to teams that, that maybe didn't um, perform as well and obviously we talked about the ones where they had some conflicting nature but there was a couple of teams that people felt maybe didn't utilize the first round as best as they could have. Um, the first one was the Atlanta Falcons taking Mario Edwards fairly early on in the draft. Um, he obviously went six overall. A lot of people saying that um, Mario Edwards is probably not the best um, best option for them here. Um, I mean, there were some scathing reviews in terms of where they felt Edwards could possibly be in comparison to other defensive ends in the draft. But a lot of people were sort of come to the conclusion that he's probably not quite the, the type of player that you'd want as, as number six overall in, in the draft if you were selecting it. So a lot of people felt that that was maybe an, a lost opportunity for the Falcons. Likewise, a lot of people saying that the Green Bay Packers had a, 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 a difficult first round, obviously taking the defensive tackle. I, I think that probably is a little bit of a reflection on the league and, and the view on effectiveness of defensive tackles and that you, know, you don't necessarily need a true elite defensive tackle to be to win um, and it doesn't really demonstrate itself in in wins anyway if you have someone of that nature so a lot of people felt that that was a another missed opportunity by the the Green Bay Packers and then the other team that uh, people sort of suggesting didn't have the greatest first round was the New Orleans Saints so if we uh, we have a little look here I, I'm guessing that's because they um, they took this linebacker, um, Kent, the Kentrell brothers, who, I mean, I'm not too sure about this view, but there was a, a came through strong in, in the um, the polling that maybe brothers was not quite a, the right type of linebacker to, to, to be a first round pick, and some people feeling that he probably isn't um, isn't going to possibly perform or be that type of starter linebacker that you'd probably want if you were acquiring a, a first round pick for him. I mean, on paper, I don't think he's that bad. I, mean, I think a lot of people look at the agility, agility rating and, and are really worried about that. And um, there was a discussion going on in terms of the server of players arriving with that agility rating at linebacker and just being out of the league basically by the end of their contract. I would give a counter argument and say I'll, I'll be very interested to see how the development cycle works now so for those of you who are not aware the CSFL changed its development cycle last season um, to a more aggressive um, progression system with a more aggressive decline for, for aging players as well so I'm going to be very interested to see how he does with that because we haven't really seen that that type of thing yet and given that agility is probably his worst rating for his position whether that will, will bump him up um, a little bit more aggressively as, as we go along. I mean, looking at it, there's questions around his work ethic as well, so maybe that might hinder him. But he's got good leadership skills, so possibly that could balance out. So a lot of people felt that the Saints maybe missed, missed an opportunity there as well. So if we move away from the, 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 the teams and views on, on the first round, the other questions that we obviously we posed was around who, which player do you think has the brightest future? And which one, you know, which draft he dropped too far in your eyes. So in terms of the brightest future, there was um, sort of really two names that, that stood out. Um, the obvious one was um, was none other than um, the Miles Jack, who went first overall. No, not much of a surprise there. He he is a phenomenal talent. He is probably going to be one of the the best linebackers in this league for a long, long time. Um, he's got fantastic speed, strength, agility, tackling, intelligence, hands as well, and he's got the endurance. The only thing that's probably going to hold him back to begin with is that position skill, but he should develop that over time. So no surprise that the Miles Jack stood out as, as, a, as a guy that people felt he's going to have a really bright future in the CSFL. The other one um, was... Number two pick, which was was Yannick uh, Nagakoi, I'm going to say that is. I probably got that name completely wrong, but a lot of people thought that was a you know good pick up, um, second best player in the draft probably, um, a really really good defensive end. He's got speed, tackling, agility. He's got strength. He's going to cause all sorts of problems. The other thing is he has great position skill, not just at defensive end but at defensive tackle, so he can slide across the positions there. So a lot of people feeling that the 49ers, as you know, 
picked up a great a great player here. And it's really interesting when you compare that to the first two questions in terms of some people feeling the 49ers didn't have the greatest of, of first rounds and others feeling they had a good first round. And a lot of it, I, I'm assuming, is pinned back to, to this guy here and, and how, how he performs. There was also a really interesting view from a couple of teams. It wasn't necessarily a, a majority view, though, but it was, it was a, a minority view that, that Jack Heaps was a really good pickup. And, you know, I'll be honest, I didn't necessarily look into that until we, we saw the polling. But I, I can see why. He's got great accuracy, intelligence, arm, and he basically is like a light version of Bridgewater, who, as we all know, um, had won the won the Super Bowl last year with, with Stewart as the GM, and very similar nature in that he has that accuracy rating, and he's not necessarily got that arm. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see how Heaps does with the the Raiders if they're going to try and build in in a similar sort of fashion to the Rams, and see if that can get them um, back on the winning trajectory this season or, or maybe future seasons. So interesting to see that, that that nuance in terms of approach by quarterback did, did come through a little bit in terms of the questions we asked. So thank you very much for everyone who, who sent in their views and questions, and it was, it was great. I mean, I'll give you just a couple of examples of some of the, uh, the views, it, you know, some verbatim comments, because it was fantastic to hear some of the detail and effort that you guys put into to try and respond to this. I mean, in, in terms of, um, you know, best and worst teams, um, there was a view that, um, you know, Carolina, whilst they had a lot of firsts and seconds, only got one starter in Sheriff. I mean, take a view of that if you want. Um, others saying that, um, you know, Washington had a fantastic draft because they managed to acquire um, Johnson, the, the running back who a lot of people probably view could have gone in the top 10 at least. So a lot of people saying that, uh, you know, the comment there was essentially along the lines of, you know, they drafted Dave Robinson, who's a fantastic five-year, $2.5 million deal at 15. Still a pick. He's not the fastest, but he's got strength, agility to go with his speed. You know, he's the best pick all round, period, someone said on him. So fantastic. interesting to see some of those comments. But thank you once again for everyone for putting those those together. We will try and pull together some more polls as we, we go along the off-season, go into the season. Um, and we'll obviously share the views on, on the show here. So, away from your views, what, what do I think of the draft so far? I, I would probably give my view as saying that the first round, there was some really, really good talent in here. Um, there's, there's no denying that. Um, we've talked about some of them. Um, you know, we haven't even talked about Jalen Ramsey, who looked like, looks like he's going to be a phenomenal cornerback um, in this league. You know, the first round looked like they had some great, great talent. The second round was a mixed bag, I think it's fair to say. There were some really, really good players sort of cup standing out I would probably cite that the Doug Middleton who started the second round was a really really good pickup I think he's going to be a strong free safety going forward um there's obviously some misses and some hits and I think that's that's a nice little flavor to see as we go into sort of the the back end of the third round and the the, the remaining rounds um over the export I think it's great to see um how that how that's playing out and um I think the, the crux that's going to come down to this draft is going to be how the development cycle works. Obviously, um, we were going to expect some of these players to be um, developing in a quicker fashion than what they would have previously. So for those of you, again, who probably haven't been in, in the league or been in a, a draft day sports pro, bar, pro football league before, um, you, you may have seen um, or heard that traditionally when guys get drafted the ratings they tend to have when they get drafted is tends to be what they have through their career there's not really much of a development change but with this new version 22 there was a change to be able to tweak that and make it you know more re as close to realistic as you, as you could get within the uh, the options that are available so it's going to be really interesting to see how that tailors against this draft because it is as i said it is the first one is going to be going through this for their full length of their career so i would say watch this space on here but i think there's some there's been some great talent in here i mean for me personally i think it was fun, really interesting to see some kickers taken in the third round you know showing the value of um of, of that skill and how that's probably still is a need across the league and um, being taken up that that high up so i'm sure as we go through the uh, the fourth fifth sixth and seventh round we'll see some other other gems and they're hidden away through scouting and we'll probably see some other hits and misses and, uh, and that's fantastic. I'm really looking forward to seeing 
how the rest of the draft plays out. But um, that's just a quick snippet of, of how we are to date. Um, but let's, let's move on and talk a little bit about um, a couple of trades really that have been going down in it during the draft time. So obviously we can sit here and talk about the various types of, um, of draft deals that have happened. Um, you know, we, we mentioned obviously previously about the charges moving up. Um, but let's move away from that and let's talk about one that's slightly uh, more controversial because it is going through the trade committee at this moment in time and that is um, the, the trade between the Cleveland Browns and the Carolina Panthers to essentially give Cleveland the opportunity to have a elite wide receiver in their midst. Um, it is none other than um, Odell Beckham Jr. who will go to his player card and have a little look for him. But the, the trade essentially um, was, was consider um, moving um, a couple of first round picks um, to the Panthers in exchange for Beckham and some other bits and pieces on the package. So the, I'm not going to talk about the trade committee views or, or anything like that because I, I don't have sides to them anyway. So I'm just going to give a view in terms of the question that stood out for me when thinking about this and one that I wanted to bring to the show was what type of value does a wide, an elite wide receiver have to a team? And, and does that really generate wins for a team? So it's a controversial topic. Um, you'll have different GMs who have different views. Some will say that having an elite wide receiver is absolutely fundamental to having a team be able to put points on the board um, because they can, they can make plays, they can make catches when needed. They have the speed and agility to get away and you know they give you an, a legitimate elite threat for a quarterback to have and there'll be others who say no you probably need a mixture of different types of guys and you can kind of make do with without without one so i thought it'd be interesting to move away from from beckham uh, for a minute and go and talk about the la not the la chargers the la rams um, the team obviously won the, the Super Bowl this year and um, just, you know, it's always good, I find, that if you um, if you are still learning the game or you're still, you know, trying to develop a strategy and think about players and how it all fits together, always go and look at the teams that stay at the top because whilst they all have a different approach, you'll get a blend of how what things do work, what things, you know, uh, how they how they fit together and you can kind of build your own style on this so obviously the la rams won the the uh super bowl last season but you know apart from um the likes of of, of decker here um if we scroll over to his stats you know he is a very very good wide receiver i don't think anyone would be sitting here saying he's a truly elite wide receiver He's, you know, he's got agility, he's got speed, he's got hands, but nothing is really elite in terms of if we go and look at any of the elite wide receivers. He obviously doesn't have much strength either as well, which means he probably doesn't break tackles that often. So the Rams obviously a good example of a team that doesn't have that elite wide receiver, but made it work and, and managed to get themselves to a Super Bowl. However, if you go and look at some other teams, so we'll go and look at the, uh, the Detroit Lions. Obviously a slightly different approach. Um, they have Calvin Johnson, who is probably the, the best wide receiver in the league. And you know that, that's the approach that they've taken and they obviously won um, many games last season. So you know there is a balance in approach here. But, and as I said, you'll get GMs who have different views on this. You know, we'll talk about the Titans who went unbeaten. I mean, this is a little bit of a change from, from last season, but um, you know, at the moment on paper, they don't have that elite wide receiver going into this season. So similar type of approach, I guess, to the Rams in that that's what they're building. So I guess, what is my view? I mean, I think that it really comes down to two things. One, how elite is your quarterback? I think if you have a better quarterback and a more accurate quarterback, you can kind of get away with not having those elite wide receivers because if we go and look again at the Rams for a second here, I keep going to Chargers. <laughs> if we go look at the Rams, you know, obviously 
no one, I don't think many people would say Bridgewater is one of the top five quarterbacks in the league, but he is a really, really accurate quarterback. His stats show that he's nearly 70% in terms of his percentage, of, you know, here. So I think if you have that type of quarterback, you can get away with having, um, you know, wide receivers who are good, but not great. However, if you have a quarterback who probably doesn't have that type of rating, then you do need extra performance from those wide receivers. You do need the elite wide receiver to be able to make the play, make the catch, maybe when it's not necessarily there, you know, in the right position, it's maybe slightly left or right, or, you know, slightly on different routes of what he's running. That is when I think you need one. And I think that comes through in, in this game from what I've seen um, and talked, a few, for, talked through a few examples there. So coming back to the Cleveland Browns, obviously, their big drafty acquisition was Jacoby Brissett. His accuracy rating is actually fairly good um, at 85. I mean, he's, he's got the intelligence as well. And assuming he progresses down this path, he could be one of the more accurate quarterbacks in the league and probably one of the more elite quarterbacks in the league over time. So there's a balancing act here to do if you was the GM of the Browns, in my opinion. And that is, at what point do you say, Okay, I can. Brissett is clearly good enough. I don't need those truly elite wide receivers to get myself wins. That's the big question. Obviously, Brissett being a rookie, we don't know how he's actually going to perform when he gets into a playbook, gets into a certain strategy. We'll see how that all develops. So, I think the logic in terms of the Browns trying to acquire Beckham at this moment in time. Although Brissett probably will go down the path of being one of the better, more accurate quarterbacks, makes absolute sense. And I think that's why they've aggressively looked at Beckham, because he's got great hands, he's got speed. You know, they're relying on his expertise to offset some of possibly the question marks that remain around Brissett and being a rookie quarterback. So the trade absolutely, absolutely makes sense. There's obviously a question mark in terms of value and that's why it's gone to the trade committee but i didn't really want to talk about that i wanted to just talk about that that sort of logic and i don't think there's necessarily a right approach to it but I, as i said i think there's different motives for different types of wide receivers and you can perform and get great results with both types you could have a set of four or five wide receivers who probably aren't anywhere near the top 20 in the league and still you know get the right get great yardage get great percentages um, if you have the right type of quarterback. And I think that's the crux of it. It comes down to that balance between having the right type of players and having the right strategy and the right playbook to really make those players shine. And if you don't have both, then you'll really, really struggle to um, to, to win anything in, in, in Draft Day Sports Pro Football 22. So that kind of brings us to the conclusion of the the show for today i hope you've enjoyed it um it's been interesting to just break down a couple of the draft things and a couple of the um a couple of the just one trade essentially that is causing a bit of a debate at the moment but of course before we end the show we have got to dive into the csfl gm bites and i know i know you've all been waiting to the end of the show to find out who last week's gm was I'm going to play the clip now and then we will come back and I'll give you the answer and obviously we'll play a new one. We do have a new one lined up and as always, get guessing as next week I'll obviously reveal who that GM is as well. The CSFL kickoff show. So you've heard the recording. Who do you think it is? Of course, it is none other than the Indianapolis Colts GM Taz. Taz, thank you very much for being the first GM on the CSFL GM Bytes. I don't know if anyone actually got that one this week. Um, if you did, um, drop us a line on, on, the, on the channel here or on the server and, um, and let me know. But uh, yeah, thank you very much, Taz, for, for, for being the first one. And now we have the, the second one up. Uh, here is number two for our CSFL GM Bytes. You are listening to the GM Byte on the CSFL kickoff show. 
So there you have it, our number two GM for the CSFL GM Bytes. Get your guesses into the Discord server and all will be revealed next week. Thank you very much for tuning in and listening to the show. And best of luck to every GM on the remaining couple of rounds of the draft. And we will be back next week to talk closing draft, trades, free agency, kicking off again, all those great things.